Yeah, so initially I wanted to cover some parts about symbolization, but uh, this talk already turned out to be pretty long, so we won't talk about symbolization improvements. Uh, yeah, today we will talk only about stack trace improvements, hopefully. And yeah, hello, I'm Andri, I'm from Meta, working on all things BPF and libpf. And so I, uh, I will cover like what, what kind of APIs we have today to capture stack traces from BPF programs and uh, what are their quirks, downsides, and uh, what's lacking or like, what's problematic, and suggest some ideas how we can improve this going forward. So how, how it all started in BPF. Like we, we had a stack trace map, which you kind of define like this. You, you say this is a stack trace. Uh, you, you have to predefine how, how many elements you, like it can in theory contain. Uh, the key is always 32-bit integer because we use IDs as an identifier of the uh, stack trace. And then the value you can see is just array of U64 values. Uh, of like up to, by default, 127. I think this constant is 127, but you have a way to uh, dynamically change it with syscuttle. Uh, and so once you have this map, you will use the BPF helper called BPF get stack ID, where you would pass the program context because that's it. Uh, that's important depending on the program type. Like we internally do the uh, stack unwinding differently. And this stack map and like some additional flags. So that's the basics, and this is how you look. Uh, how you used it on the BPF side. You call it. You pass the uh, the map, the context. You can pass some flags, and one of the like one of the important and commonly used uh, flags is user stack, and that defines whether you capture kernel stack trace or user stack trace. Uh, you get back ID, which can be like negative to sign signal error, of course. Uh, but if it's not, then you got some ID, which you can record, for example, in some capture sample which you send over ring buffer or like through map or whatever. And then on the user side, you get this ID somehow, right? Sample use tag ID. Uh, and then you can do just normal map, map lookup uh, through BPF syscall, and that will return you that array basically, right? So uh, in addition to all of that, uh, we, we added support to capture not just the, not the absolute address, but actually sort of internally resolve it to ELF build ID and the file of set within it. And that helps a lot in a lot of uh, production setups to, to have like unique identification of like what, what the binary was that this address belonged to and do symbolization like offline basically, like not on the server where you capture this tech trace, but like on some dedicated fleet of symbolizers. So this, this helps minimize the overhead of the of stack capture and like profiling in production. Uh, to, to request that from the kernel, you need to create the, this stack, stack trace map with extra map flag, user build ID. And then like the value, instead of being U64, each value is this like small struct, or not that small, it's 32 bytes, I think. Uh, but the point is that kernel will fill out build ID if it can determine it. And if not, it will notify that like it's still absolute IP, uh, IP address. Uh, and so this is, this is very useful in practice. Like we, we use it all the time. Uh, so what about the quirks of this API? Well, first of all, and it's not so much quirk, but like this, the idea of using 32-bit uh, identifier of the stack trace is actually great and users, like from user feedback, it, it makes life easier and simpler because, you know, like you normally capture some additional information and stack trace is just like one of the pieces of information. So having something small, fixed, uh, that you can just put into your sample is, is very convenient. Uh, so I just want to call this out. Uh, then, like the other quirk is that you you can never request both kernel and user stack trace like in one go, even though like internally kernel supports this. The way that like we implemented the the API, basically you can only request user space or only kernel, uh, which which seems fine. No one no one ever complained about this, at least to me. Uh, and. Uh, one weird thing, and like I actually don't remember how we handle this in practice, is that there is no way to know, it seems like there is no way to know how many IP addresses you actually captured. So like out of this array, like first n entries will be real addresses and everything else will be garbage potentially because we don't zero initialize like the rest. Uh, and so, but I guess like it's not that much of a problem in practice because I don't remember anyone also mentioning this. And so, I don't know, people just, 
just stop processing IP when it stops looking like IP, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, this is, this is a quirk we have. Uh, and the, the other like super important aspect of this is the automatic stack duplication, which means that if we have the stack trace map, we capture stack trace, and we already captured exactly the same stack trace before, kernel will actually reuse the same slot and will return the, the, the same ID. And this is very important because it has huge implications on everything. Uh, so before I go further, any questions about the API? Everyone is familiar with this? All right, good. So uh, the good parts of this API is that, well, we have a fast specialized hash map implementation for this map. Uh, we do this stack the duplication, which saves space uh, overall, right? Because some, some stacks inevitably will be repeatable. Uh, but it's clear in the design of the API and the implementation that like the, the main drivers were like efficiency and performance of this, right? And so this special hash map implementation does not support hash collisions. So it's, it's implemented as like a bucket uh, of, like normal, normal hash map in, in BPF is implemented as like a bucket of list, linked lists, right? This is also buckets, but with no linked list. It's one element per bucket, basically. And so the bad part of all of this is that unfortunately hash collisions do happen. They can be pretty frequent and they are pretty much unavoidable. Like I remember many years ago, I did some experiments and I allocated a huge stack, uh, stack trace map and I still was getting uh, hash collisions even with like a small amount of actually captured stack traces. So like it's just a fact of life, we will have hash collisions for like different stack traces. And so uh, the API itself gives you some tweaks of, on how to deal with that, like one of them is, and it's not so much tweak, but it's, it's another hack, I would say. Fast stack compare says, don't even bother checking if the stack trace itself is the same. Just check the hash. And if hash matches, assume that the stack trace ma matches, right? So that's like a speed up again. Like this is like clearly like for performance reasons, right? But it's kind of dangerous because you don't really know if it's actually the same stack trace. Uh, but besides that, we also have this reuse stack ID uh, flag, which turns on overwriting of the previously captured stack trace that happened to have a hash collision, but is a different stack trace, right? And so uh, you, you are facing two like one decision and like two bad outcomes, basically. You have to make a decision for yourself whether you are losing data, meaning like you don't capture a new stack trace if it happened to collide with some previously captured stack trace and it's different, and then you just drop it, basically. Or you choose to corrupt your old data, basically. And uh, by allowing override, any of the IDs handed out previously for some previously captured stack trace now will be like silently overwritten. So if by that time you haven't captured like the actual stack trace, uh, like in user space, then you are screwed and you don't even know about this, basically. And so in practice, in our production at least, we never use reuse stack ID. And the first time we, we ran into this, it was a big surprise and uh, a moment of revelation. And like since then, we, we always disable reuse stack ID, basically, right? Uh, so uh, also this deduplication, uh, which is like, Trans, sort of transparent to the user it means that removing anything from this stack trace while BPF can put something to this stack trace map is inherently racy because you know you never know whether uh, some BPF program at the same moment is capturing stack trace that happens to to be the exactly the same stack trace that was captured before and you are trying to remove from user space basically right so user space might delete it but like you already kind of captured it in a, in a new sample and so it might be uh, might go away and you know it, it's just inherently racy because it's it's not really exposed to user that like here is the ref count or whatever right and that means that it's, it's kind of dangerous uh, to to be able to aggressively free up space by uh, consuming sample with the capture stack ID and uh, then like immediately removing it from the uh, stack trace map uh, so in general, I would say stack trace is not very well suited for like longer running sessions where like you capture stack trace over like some like non-brief period of time, which we we have. Uh, and uh, but like you, 
the, initially it was like the only way to do this, right? So like people had to work around this, and like the way that we deal with this is through double buffering. So we would allocate two identical stack trace maps, and we would just designate one of them as active and another one as like being consumed by user space. And like the, the way that like we switch is normally by time, right? Like every half second or whatever, we would just switch like which stack trace is. Uh, is active. It's I mean, it, it minimizes the amount of uh, hash collisions. It doesn't eliminate them completely. And so, like, uh, there are lots of. Well, the pro is that it actually makes it more or less uh, reliable and decently working in practice. The cons are that you are wasting a lot of memory because you need two copies of the stack trace map. It complicates the code, the setup, of course, a little bit, but still. And uh, it still leaves like this brief race, uh, like tr like race of window of races, uh, right, like where the, there could be still some BPF program that is capturing stack trace while user space already assumes that you can start like uh, pulling data from uh, this map and like clearing it. But it's usually pretty small, so it's not causing troubles. And so, but we, we like as, as we deployed this, right, like we got some kind of feedback and observations from uh, actual usage is, and we noticed that this deduplication So as I was saying, from from practice, we noticed that uh, deduplication is not that necessary. I would say uh, we were getting like low one point something deduplication factor, basically. And uh, it, it's kind of expected, especially for like on CPU profiling, like when you profile like diverse production workloads, right? Usually you will have slightly different address somewhere, even if like general stack trace is kind of the same when symbolized, the actual address and the like, actual offset within some function will usually differ. And so uh, we found that the duplication just makes our life harder without like bringing too much benefit. Uh, so, the the request the idea was let's uh, let's allow user to manage the memory instead of like having this uh, stack trace map, and so eventually we added a new API called BPF get stack without ID right, and the the idea here is that user provides the buffer into which kernel will just capture stack trace and there will be like no memory management on kernel side, uh, user can pre-allocate it either like in some per CPU temporary map or like in map value and whatever, right? Uh, by letting user provide memory, we bypass like a lot of, a lot of complications. Uh, also, the good part is that it actually returns the amount of uh, data that is actually filled out. And it was very good foresight. It clears out the rest of the bytes of the, in, in this buffer, which makes this overall buffer usable as part of the hash key. Because if you don't clear the, the remaining bytes that are not filled out with actual IP addresses, like then uh, it, it will, if used by, as part of the hash map key, it will be just ra random garbage, and so lookup will fail. Uh, so that, that was a really good part. And uh, again, like how the user uses it, whether they do their own deduplication in hash map, or they just send it directly through ring buffer, perf buffer, or like even technically they can do some analysis inside the BPF program based on the addresses, even though I'm not aware of, of anyone doing this, right? Like it's technically possible. And so this API proved to be very useful, and right now all but like one of the use cases uses BPF get stack in favor of uh, the stack trace map. So that was good. And uh, well, are we happy? Well, not 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 quite, right? There are still some problems, and uh, the, the problem is not so much in the implementation, but rather like the in the contract, right? We use the both of the available APIs are synchronous by nature, right? They assume that the stack trace will be captured right there at the uh, at the call to the helper. And uh, because this this can be used from K probes, trace points, whatever, right? Like we have to assume like the very the very worst case, which is NMI context, in which you cannot uh, fault, you cannot wait for any memory to be paged in, you you, you really can't do much, right? And so uh, this, this means that some stack traces are 
potentially unreliable when it comes to user stack traces, right? User, user space stack traces. Uh, it also has uh, implications on fetching build ID if you are requesting build ID because we also had to implement it like very conservatively, right? And so the build ID uh, parsing logic, uh, again, makes NMI assumptions effectively, right? So it requires that build ID uh, is first in the very first page of the L file important, uh, and if it's not, then too bad. Uh, and also, that page has to be physically present in memory, which is not always the case. Have you run into the build ID not being in the first page in practice? So we at Meta, we didn't, but I remember someone from Google were complaining that they have like very big unreliability with build ID, and it was surprising to us because like we don't normally have this problem. And so now when I learned about this first, uh, first page of L file, I'm thinking maybe they actually had binaries where this uh, node is not in the first page of the L. Okay. Because I don't think anything dictates that like compiler has to put it like the first thing, right? There's nothing that dictates it, but uh, core dumps also have a similar restriction, kind mm. of, because uh, core dumps, with the default way that core dumps are configured, we only dump the first page of a of an executable. So compilers try to do that, yeah. basically. Yeah. Well, but like if you have a lot of uh, sections, for example, or segments, right? Like you, you can push it out effectively. Technically, yeah, right? if you're not careful about it, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I don't know if that's actually the problem. Well, for, for us at Matt, I don't think that's the problem because we didn't notice that much. Mm. But maybe we didn't look too hard. You know, it, it's always the question. Uh, but I just noticed it as I, as I was working on another patch set. And I was like, ah, oh, okay, yeah, that's another restriction. Uh, probably the bigger restriction is just uh, this, this first page of the L file being physically present in, in memory, right? Well, the good news is that kernel stack traces are not affected by all of this, right? The kernel stack trace implementation, I mean, kernel, kernel memory is always physically present in memory, and so kernel stack traces are super reliable, which is very good thing in, in what I'm going to propose. And so also this, this synchronous approach, right, makes it almost like fundamentally incompatible with like the stuff like EH frame, like dwarf-based stack unwinding, or like upcoming as frame, because those technologies assume that the ALF has like some re re relatively large uh, tables, right, in ALF file that might not be physically present in memory because they are not actually used in, well, EH frame might be used in practice, but in, in, in runtime, but like S frame is just like additional metadata, right? And so uh, integrating S frame into like our existing APIs, like, I mean, it's possible, but also in this conservative way where like we will try, but if it's not present, then like we have to bail out, right? Uh, and, and basically all of this is because of the like non-faultable context that we have to assume. And so, uh, well, I think we need some new API, a new approach, uh, and I think it has to be asynchronous, right? Uh, going back to kernel stack traces, uh, asynchronous and kernel stack traces is actually a no-go because like, when you are in kernel, like some K-Pro, perf event or whatever, you do want kernel stack trace right there, right now. It has to be synchronous, right? So this API, even though I say it's asynchronous for kernel stack traces, it has to be synchronous, and well, again, Luckily, kernel stack traces don't have problems, so we just capture synchronously and pretend it's like asynchronous or whatever. Uh, so that, that's fine, and I just wanted to get this out of the way, right? It, it works well right now, and it will keep working with the new API. But the user stack traces are different, right? The key observation here is that you don't have to capture user stack traces right there, like when this helper is uh, called. You can delay it all the way to until kernel is returning to user space, because user uh, strat has to be frozen all the way there, right? And return to user space is actually a nice, cozy, sleepable, or faultable context, right? At that point, we can do uh, faults, like wait for memory to be paged in, do whatever we need, right, to get the necessary data. And so the, the idea behind this like new API is that like we'll just set some bit or like maintain some link or whatever like the implementation detail, but like we will request at the exit to user space, uh, similar to like sleepable U probe and stuff like this, right? Just to capture stack trace and then put it somewhere, right? Um, questions? Okay. Sorry, I don't know why I thought you still had it. Um, so were you thinking of putting that on like the task flags field? Like for the needs reschedule? Something like idea? that, yeah. 
Yeah, like there is this TIF set of flags, like we use it for your probe, so something like that probably for stack traces. How would, and how would you associate like the buffer that you want to copy it into? If you well, again, this is the implementation tell, but like, you know, simplistically you can have a list of like memory addresses where you should put the stack trace or something like that. I don't know. This is all slide bar, by the way, right? Like I, I haven't written any code and it's more like, here is the ideas and like we, we should discuss like what's the best way to design the API and all that gotcha. stuff, yeah. Okay, thanks. And, and so the, 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 the API that I envision is trying to take good parts of like the existing API, but then like solve the, the problems. And so something like BPF gets stack ID, which is used with a stack trace map, and would return like a short 32-bit ID, would be great, because that's what users actually want, right? They, they, they have not so much problem, but it's, it's definitely a different, uh, different way of using this if you do the uh, BPF get stack, which writes into user-provided buffer, right? It's, it's a little bit harder to retrofit it into existing code. So something that would still return this fixed 32-bit uh, ID would be great. But in this case, ID would be sort of a reservation, a promise, right? This is fixed, it's not changing, but the data is still not there because for user stack traces, like we, we don't capture it immediately. But having ID allows to record it in whatever sample, send it back to user space, and like the only problem is that user space will need to potentially wait a little bit for, for it to be available. Yeah. Do you think it might be useful to have this feature be, you, will, you can write a BPF program that is called in this path where you return to user space and you basically guarantee that you can page anything in. So it's not just stack traces. I'll, like I'll get to that yeah. okay. in, in the last slide, yeah. Uh, again, as I mentioned, kernel stack trace will be captured synchronously, but you know, like the synchronous is just generalization of synchronous API. And so you, you have idea, you, you could already look up this data, but you, you might as well just postpone it. And as I said, user stack trace will be basically scheduled to be captured at the return to user space, and like we will provide some way to say like where to put the captured data, basically, right? And uh, I mean, like at the outset, right? Like if we do it as a like standalone map, then map lookup for such ID that doesn't yet have data will have to return something like E again, and user space will have to. Uh, Retry later, and, and th this is this is like one of the biggest discussion points here, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, be before I go to that, right, I want to mention the deduplication. As I said, right, deduplication makes life very hard. It's it's an attempt to save space, uh, but it makes everything slower, co more complicated, more convoluted. So I think that like this new API should just forego the idea of using the stack deduplication, at least as part of the kind of user contract, I would say. Uh, and so user space should be able to assume that like one ID maps to one unique uh, stack trace, and if there is like a map interface, deleting that ID should be race free, basically, right? Like you, on the user space side, you know that like you you captured this ID, you are the single user of this ID, and so user space re removing this doesn't corrupt any data, doesn't conflict with any other captured stack traces, right? Uh, so, yeah, that, that's my thinking on, on the duplication. Having said oh, that, sorry, quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, when you say unique ID, you mean it can be duplicated. It's not unique. Like, there might be duplicate stacks with different IDs. Stacks could be duplicated, but yeah, yeah, like it's one to, I don't know how to say it, right? But like, if you got ID, for some stack trace, and then you got exactly the same stack trace, it will have different ID because it was different API call, basically. Okay, right, so the stacks aren't unique, uh, yeah. it's the IDs, okay. But uh, uh, like th this slide discusses, like we can technically still do the, the duplication, we'll just hide it from user, right, and still have this property that each call to this like capture stack trace, async or whatever, returns you a different ID every single time, right? And so you can assume that this ID can be cleaned up, except that if you do like some sort of internal deduplication, right, the, then like map delete element would have to take that into account and do like its own internal ref counting, right? So it, it's, it's complication. It's also a kind of CPU versus memory trade-off, right? Like doing the hash, hash collision detection, comparisons, like all this stuff, like just add CPU overhead at the expense of like maybe saving some memory, but, but making everything else more complicated, doing ref counting, that's all CPU overhead, right? In my opinion, like deduplication is not worth it, right? If we give user a way to quickly consume the stack trace in user space and just like go and say like, okay, clean it up immediately, then, uh, I think in most cases, like it will be a fast loop where you would be consuming consuming stack traces as you capture them, like storing them in like some user space buffers and giving back this space back to kernel for reuse, right? And so like the the memory usage 
should be decently controlled, I, I think. And also, given if, given if it's asynchronous, you can grow the map over time, right? Yeah. You can, you can allocate yeah, yeah. memory later. And it's all the implementation talent, actually. The, like the next part will be discussion whether we need a map or like there are some other ways. Uh, but I think the, the main pain point here is the notification, right? Like how the user space knows that some ID, some stack became available, right? And uh, I have a few thoughts just to kind of like see the, the conversation. And I have some, after, after like writing all of that, I, I came to some conclusions. So let's go through that. Like first, like the trivial solution is just do nothing, basically. Say it's user's problem, and uh, we don't do any notification. We just say user space will get E again when they try, and they will have to schedule retry on their own pace. And uh, well, this is great because it's simple, but it's not great for users because they will have to basically potentially waste a lot of uh, effort to, to try to get uh, stack traces. But maybe it's not actually that bad because the stack trace would have to be captured like almost immediately uh, like once the traced process exits to user space, which should happen pretty fast, right? So maybe actually in practice not that bad. But uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to think and, and decide. But this is kind of the give up way of doing this. The easy way would be to, do, to add like ePoll a notification support, but per entire map, if you do a map, right? And uh, so you would be able to ePoll map and notification will, like, notification will be sent when any of the capture stack traces becomes available, right? So like there is no like distinction, it's just like something changed about this map and user space can go and like retire all the pending IDs, which is also inefficient, but like at least they don't have to do it when nothing happened, right? Uh, so it's not great, but it's simple for, for kernel implementation at least. Then there is like a wasteful way where we will allow to do this per each ID effectively, right? But then it requires basically creating like a new file descriptor for, for each stack trace. So it's wasteful on system resources. It, like we need like wait queue hat in each slot. I, I think it's just also like not acceptable solution to be honest. And so I started thinking, like, okay, like, what's what's the ways to work around that? And uh, maybe the way is to actually use reuse one of the building blocks that we have, which is actually dealing pretty well with like so all sort of notification, and that's ring buffer, right? So what if we use ring buffer to send notification about some ID being ready, right? Uh, ring buffer is fast. We know that like it doesn't have to be per CPU, so you can save memory like by sharing the buffer, and it works well in practice. Uh, as I said, notifications are efficient if you have like a batch of IDs coming fast and user space didn't consume them, they will get like just one notification and we'll do like a batch processing. So it actually works out pretty well in practice. Uh, the only problem with this is like what to do when ring buffer is full and you cannot send notification, right? Sorry, I might be wildly off base here, but haven't you just in the past five slides described the IOU ring um, CQE mechanism. Maybe it's during buffer with notification, yeah. Well, well, the whole point, right, is that you want to, um, at least in the multi-shot use case, right, you want to say, like, I want to be triggered repeatedly. I want to get completion events repeatedly for this thing which happens on the kernel side space. And then you just get a stream of CQEs telling you that you can now go read whatever it was you wanted to read. So, so just the way you're describing it sounds almost exactly but like... our ring buffer is basically that, yeah. It's, it's a very simple ring buffer with e notification. So yes, yeah. Uh, I actually don't know like, if IOU ring would help with this like, uh, full situation, right? But like, fundamentally, anything that is like a fixed size ring buffer would, would have to deal with the problem, like what if you don't have a space in ring buffer to send like, even eight bytes, basically, right? And that's my main concern here, and we'll need to deal with that. Yeah, Joe. Yeah, I was thinking a little bit about something that John said the other day about, I guess, processing events and push versus pull, um, and, and like how frequently you're expecting and how much of this data you're expecting. Because like once you reach a certain level, you basically should just be doing yeah. aggregation and pull. Well, so how do you see the that? The pure BPF ring buffer gives BPF side full control over this, right? Like you can completely disable notifications, or you can say like only send notification if you have that amount of data and all stuff, right? So maybe we'll have to incorporate that into this new API, like if you want, right? Like as, a, as just few few extra flags. Not sure. Well, but yes, this this is definitely. Uh, a consideration, right? Like, yes, we, we notice actually with ring buffer, it has nothing to do with this, but like in, with ring buffer, if the consumer is super fast, we would get notification almost for every single uh, sample. And so we like, we had cases where we had to like add the logic to BPF side to like don't send notification every single time. 
and only like every so often. And, and that helps a lot for, with CPU. And yeah, I assume like IU ring has similar problems, right? With min timeout and all stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a common problem with anything like this, right? And so, but, but going back to this topic, right? BPF ring buffer has to be assumed to be full sometimes, potentially, right? And so what, what will we do in this case? And I don't have like good answer, right? Like one answer is like, well, make it user's problem, of course, as usual, right? And just say like, well, some IDs might never arrive, basically, and you should just like time them out if, you, if you're waiting for them. Not great. Uh, another, another option might be to have some per map uh, or whatever per ring buffer stats where like we would count like number of missed uh, IDs or like maintain list. I, I actually don't know. Maybe just counter would be enough, right? Just saying like, okay, something was dropped. Like go double check, I guess, or something. Um, could we use something like the arena for this perhaps where you can, you can have some big VA range and you, you map it in on the return to user space path if you need to fault in more memory for the stack trace? Because the ring buffer is statically sized obviously, but if you had an arena maybe you could make uh, it dynamic. How, like how, how arena like changes anything like you, you, because you can like allocate more memory? Yeah, because you can, you can <clears throat> reserve a really big VA range where you know that you're going to be able to put like as many samples as you need essentially and then you... But then what's the protocol for user space to, to consume that? I mean like you have to build a ring buffer basically on top of uh, Arena. Yeah, but this is basically just a ring buffer that can, that can grow uh, dynamically. I, I don't know, you'd, you'd have to have some kind of protocol built on top of it in user well, space. Well I would say but... if you know how to build growable ring buffer, we should just introduce that into ring buffer. Yeah, maybe it could be used for that. I mean, yeah, I, I, that's the idea with Arena, though, right? It's supposed to be like this kind of big Swiss Army knife for a lot of different use cases. But yeah, I, I, I think in practice also, though, if you just, you just have like a pretty big BPF ring buffer, and it's probably fine for 99.9% .9 of the cases. So One other idea that I had was that uh, maybe we can add like to ring buffer uh, ability to sort of reserve space, right, like with some extra uh, counter. I'm not sure if we can make it completely rest free, but technically you can have like, okay, I, when, when you do like the get stack async call, right, you know that you need to send at least the, uh, like a failure or like the drop sample notification, which will be like something small, eight bytes, right? So you can just say, ring buffer, can I, can I have a guarantee that I'll have eight or 16 bytes ready, right? Like when I need it, right? And so we, we can do like some internal accounting for that. And so if, when you get the stack trace, right? And you want to send like a full stack trace and then like it's full, right? You, you, you at least have like this small sample, which will say like this ID was dropped basically because Eno Mam on Eno space, right? So maybe that. Uh, um, again, it, it, it's sort of implementation teller, but I'm not sure like how, how to do it efficiently and whether we can do it like race free. But it's it's one way. Uh, our question is um, the whole point uh, of the notification here is that because you wanted to 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 capture the stack asynchronize uh, until the return to, to the user space, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the idea is that stack traces always go to so, user space, yeah. So why don't you just let the, uh, the program to set up a trace point at the, re at the point that return to user space so you can capture synchronize. So probably maybe just gone. You mean like that user space provides some user, user space buffer? No, no. I mean uh, to let the BB uh, set a trace point at the, the point of return to user space, before return to spa user space, so that the trace program can capture the stack synchronized before return to user space. So you'll have like a, an extra BPF program that will do this. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. So this is the same question that David asked, and I'll address it like in uh -huh. the last uh, slide. Okay. I think it's. Well, preview, right? I think it might be just already handled by BPF4Q, and that this is not really like tr we don't have to treat it as like a stack capture, right? It's just like delaying the BPF uh, subprogram to later, and then we bypass all the problems because it's user problem how to like what's the data layout and all stuff. But yeah, um, another thought: like, what if you would make the ideas the the ideas 64-bit, and then incrementing so that you can know that they never overflow. And then you have like EPOL mechanism where you can subscribe. Let's say, okay, I want to know that ID 42, once that is available, have please, a, like a please write me up. Like and a, then, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And then you know yeah. all the other ones that are older than that are there. Yeah, right? it, doesn't, it doesn't even have to be 64-bit, right? Like the, the, 
wrap around doesn't happen that frequently, so probably we can even do this with 32 bit. But yeah, 64 bit would be one way. Um, can EPOL provide this interface where you say, like, I, I don't I know? Maybe not, but maybe it's just that you need some kind of extension for that map to, you know, from the BPF system call side so that you know that, okay, if I'm calling EPOL on that file descriptor, you, you, I don't know, maybe something like this. As I said, this is the biggest pain point, yeah. Uh, but let, let's move on, right? Like, I, I don't have ideal solution. We'll have to compromise somewhere here. Uh, but then, like, I've, so, so far, I was talking about sending just notification about ID. But then I started thinking, like, what if you just completely get rid of, like, any new map, right? And just say, like, let's capture stack trace and just send the ring buffer sample directly, right? Hey, so, so just one question. Uh, can we use uh, callback instead of notification? And like, uh, when the stack is ready, uh, another BPF program is run, and the users just decide in that BPF program how they want to do the notification themselves, like whether ring buff or so something I think, else? I think it goes back to like custom BPF program that will do potentially stack, tra stack trace capture and stuff like this. And I think. That can be handled with BPF for Q. OK, I'm giving like <laughs> full answer. I think we can use BPF for Q. And then we can teach our existing synchronous APIs if they are called in sleepable context to actually be more persistent about stack trace capture, right? And then we completely bypass all these problems because then like it's up to you where you get the buffer, like where you put it, how you send it, how you notify your user space. Uh this is based, uh, I just want to make sure I clarify because I missed some of it. Um, you're talking about is still doing this from the kernel side? Yeah. Uh, it's doing the user space stack trace? Because on my to-do list, it was supposed to be for other people, but I might be doing is the S-Framework. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the ideas of the S-Framework was having any user, perf, ftrace, bpf, whatever, just say, hey, boom, I need a stack trace. And then on the you know the ptrace path in going back to user space, map in the uh, S-frame tables, create the actual stack frame, and then just send the actual stack frame to each of the callbacks. So I don't know if that's well, that, that's exactly why this new API is asynchronous, right? Because you will request this user stack trace like in perf event, for example, right? right? You cannot capture it there. So th that's that's the whole point is actually to make like it compatible with S-frame stuff. Yeah. For example, yeah. And so anyway, going back, right? Like, what if we just bypass like any new maps and just say like, give me a ring buffer and I'll put the, some record with the capture stack trace there. And like, it, it actually has a lot of upsides, right? Like if you ignore the uh, ring buffer being full problem, it has a lot of upside because then we don't have to like pre-allocate some fixed uh, size array. You can actually capture it like however many frames the pair of call chain captured and all this stuff and then send only the, the actual amount of data. Uh, and so you'll pay for what you get, basically, in terms of ring buffer uh, space usage. Uh, and like ring buffer itself, right, it always sends the uh, record size. So like th this is easy to extend because like you always can say like what fields are there or not. So it, it seems very attractive. Uh, we'll just need to think about like how we deal with ring buffer and I don't know maybe this reservation is actually a way to go like saying like well in, in good case like you should size your ring buffer properly and you will get all the stack traces and as, as soon as you consume them fast enough right like the space is reused worst case like you will definitely get a notification that like we couldn't capture stack trace or like we couldn't put it into ring buffer either way it's lost but at least you know about this. So I don't know, that, that's so far my, my thinking. And then like going back to customization. Like my initial idea was like, oh, okay. Well, first of all, before we go to customization, I think it's important to have a really good stack trace capture provided by kernel as a basic building block, right? Uh, for many reasons, it's just like ease of use and uh, also for cases like the stuff that I'm fixing right now where if you have URED probes pending while you capture stack trace, user stack trace, then like instead of actual addresses in users function, you will get like this uprobe trampoline that Jerry was talking about. And like this makes stack, stack trace completely confusing. So if you if you had like a custom BPF program that just does like a stack unwinding, it would be, or especially if you do it in user space, right? Like it would be much more confused. Well, it will be as, as confusing, but it will be harder to get like to the original uh, addresses because th they, are, they are stored in a custom uh, list of return instances. And so kernel can actually restore the, the proper addresses while 
like if you do it customly, it will be probably harder. Like you can still do it with custom VPF program if you know about this, but my, my point here is that there probably are situations where kernel knows more information and can provide better quality of data, let's say. Uh, but having said that, right, the original idea was like, okay, we can have maybe some mode where like the kernel by default will do this work for you, but if you have some custom requirements or you know more about the process or you want to do fancy dwarf unwinding all stuff, you can provide your custom BPF subprogram uh, as a callback, which will be called instead of like doing the kernel uh, logic. Uh, but then thinking about the work queue, basically, right? Like if we have work queue, which basically does this like for generic BPF subprogram, we don't have to limit this to stack traces, right? At that point, you have a sub subprogram that will be called in the foldable, sleepable context. You can capture stack trace and you can capture whatever you want and you can use Yes, yeah, sorry. Oh, oh. And, and you can use your uh, your data layout. So basically, like we just bypass like all the all the problems with the backwards compatibility and all this stuff. So I feel like this might be a completely different use case for, for work queue. And that, that's all that I had. Sorry, I ran long. Any other questions? Jordan? Oh. I have no idea how this would work, uh, but since the stack traces and maybe you know formally the stack ID are usually paired with like other bits of data that you're sending up to the user space and like a perf buffer or ring buffer, like maybe there's like some additional like switch you can be like, all right, don't send this whole struct until the stack is ready into user space. Then you get to like memory allocation problems, and like you cannot do it from NMI, for example. You will need to like postpone this sample, right? So you will have to keep it in memory somewhere. So you have to allocate memory for it. Okay. All right. So it's just complicated. And like, if you can avoid managing memory, that that makes everything simpler. And that's why asynchronous. Yeah. It's it's much easier to do in user space because you can just wait, sleep, delay. All right. Given we're right. already you. ten minutes over, uh, so we have to take this to the hallway. Thank you very much.